Hello, I'm Mike Henry from O'Reilly Media, and today I'm going to be talking with Sarah Novotny, CIO for video game publisher Meteor Entertainment. This is for our Velocity podcast series, and today's conversation is going to center mostly around bridging the gaps in organizations between development and operations group. Sarah, welcome. Thanks, Mike. It's always good to join you in the O'Reilly crowd doing fun things in technology. Great. So can you tell us a little bit about your new gig? Um, you're now the CIO at Meteor. Uh, give us a little history of you and, and Meteor as well. Sure. Um, let me start with Meteor. It's a shorter history. Um, Meteor is a free-to-play video game publishing company that was founded in October. And we are going to distribute our first title, Hawken, the, the image behind me, um, this December, uh, December 12th, in fact, so 12, 12, 12, the first day you'll be free to fight. Oh, interesting. 12, 12, 12. Good day, too. Yeah, it is a great day. Did you guys intentionally um, choose it? The marketing people loved it. They were like, we clearly have to publish on 12, 12, 12. Okay. <laughs> I guess we'll make that date. Good. Um, yeah, and my, my history is uh, I've been working in IT operations for longer than I care to admit, and uh, I sort of grew up in the early Amazon days, and then I founded a company that did remote DBA for uh, companies around the world. I was Blue Gecko, and I still sit on the board there, and now I uh, am at Meteor Entertainment. So um, you're also chair or co-chair with a couple of conferences or things like that? Yeah, I'm program chair for OzCon uh, and another a lovely O'Reilly property, similar to Velocity, only more, more programming, less infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, and I am also was program chair this year for the Percona Live MySQL conference. Great, great. Yeah, so, certainly keeps me busy. Absolutely. So also, I would imagine as a role as a CIO keeps you busy. And yep. one of your goals um, is to bridge the gap between technology and business, you know, and I think this has probably yep. been a goal for a long time for a lot of people. So why, why does it need to be done? I mean, do people really want to be bridged? I don't know if they want to be bridged, but they certainly need to. Um, there's there's the classic tension of security and technology and usability. And, and, and basically, IO has to build out policies and processes and uh, infrastructure that allow it to be very usable for the business while still um, meeting security goals, meeting good uh, infrastructure setups. I have, I have this conversation frequently uh, with with business people here. Why do we have to have our machine screens lock out? You know, well, because that's good security. Things like that. So then, in an organization, how do you educate the different stakeholders about how DevOps is kind of becoming this uh, more important, uh, almost cultural revolution and its impact it can have in IT? Oh, it's actually a really fun process uh, trying to educate people around DevOps because ops, if you're doing it right, looks like DevOps. This is a new name for something, but the the old school um, operations gets things thrown over the wall and is responsible for uptime and development is only responsible for new features has been a real problem. That's sort of the classic image of operations always says no and the dev always has to do stuff to work around them. And this was this was highlighted in um, uh, Adrian Cockcroft's post about no ops. And then John Trollin's brilliant reply, absolutely brilliant reply uh, in his inimitable style. I don't think you're calling operations what operations is. I think you guys had just a broken culture. And so I'm lucky in that Meteor has, because we're a brand new company, because it's all Greenfield, we've been able to set up the culture and the processes pretty much from the beginning that everything is repeatable, everything is programmatic, and uh, we have to, yes, we have to move at the speed of a startup, but we have to make sure that it's maintainable. And so the, the cultural, for me personally, the cultural revolution here hasn't been that difficult. The business side uh, jumped on very rapidly. But I think more broadly, uh, people who have been doing ops very well and very tightly knit with development groups for years go, why do we need this name? 
But I do think it's a cultural shift that giving it a name makes it much more identifiable. Well, in addition to being a cultural shift, um, how would someone go about setting up, in, in a large organization, setting up best practices that are repeatable around DevOps? I mean, is that something that's easily done or does that take a long time? It, it depends on the company and the culture. If there is a very ingrained culture of dev does something and then ships it to ops and ops um, blesses it and deploys it, then it's going to be a long time coming trying to get people to look at new processes, um, especially because in that sort of organization, you have the, the problems of the ops team having to firefight too frequently and the dev team not being empathetic or involved in that and then not being able to see why the ops people aren't answering their requests. You know, so it, it's, this, it's this snowball. Um, if you don't have good processes in place, you put in a lot of gap, stop gap procedures and then you have to redo them so you're getting further and further and further behind, sadly. So um, it is a very slow process, but I think the key point is to bite off little, little bits and start to move things. You know, this is the new process. We're going to do it this way. Let me work with you. And then you do that for a while until it's adopted. And then at some point, you pick up a new little chunk. But the key point being that you need to really work slowly. And, and I know it's not necessarily popular in business to talk about empathy, but realize that you're breaking someone else's world. You're changing what is going on. You're adding different and new work to them. And that can be scary or that can be complicated or that can just slow them down. And they just want it fixed. So it's, it's definitely something that you have to be um, empathetic about. I gave a talk, oh God, a few years ago where I said that um, – uh, operations is uh, IT operations is the same as nursing, and the two are going to converge as we see silicon and biology converge. Yeah. And that you, as an operations person, need to have a decent bedside manner. And just as nurses and doctors need to have a good understanding of complex systems, we've just got the difference between wetware and hardware in this case. Um, and anyone who's ever walked a CEO through the failure of a mail server and, the, you know, and something like that, you know that you walk through the seven stages of grieving. <laughs> no, we just need it back. I'm sorry, denial will not help. <laughs> it's not going to fix the problem. Then they start to bargain, well, what if I can get, you know, just a little bit of the data back, just my mailbox? You know, you, so you walk people through this. And so when you have, you have to understand that it is a cultural change, not just a programmatic change. And so you have to work within the wetware and work with the people uh, and how that process changes. And that's way harder than writing a new program. Yeah. So this convergence, I mean, you mentioned convergence, and it's obviously uh, development and operations kind of converging. Are mm -hmm. there signposts and signals showing us that this is actually happening? Um, or is it mostly that the smaller startup companies are able to kind of skip the old way of, of separating the two? Or is this actually happening in larger companies, do you think, as well? Um, I had the opportunity to be a sales engineer for OpsCode for just a little stint last fall before I took this position. And I think you are actually seeing larger companies trying to embrace it. They're having a hard time because of the cultural shift. So they're having a hard time moving what are codified practices in, in a way that is meaningful. And it gets very frustrating for the people who are trying to bring this, this new paradigm to the organizations. But I also get, we also get to see moments of big wins. And I think that um, the ChefCon is up next week. Uh, and ChefCon, I think, will show a lot of larger organizations that are trying to move to, to use another overloaded term, a very agile infrastructure, one that can move rapidly and be changed easily and uh, adapt to what the needs are of the business as opposed to the business having to adapt to the needs of the technology, which has been the way it has been for a long time. Excellent. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, the game behind you reminds me, uh, I used to love playing games, but I, I'd be very curious on how you guys do monitoring, um, you know, performance monitor, mm. monitoring and maybe even, you know, large scale changes. Yeah. Are you just cloning the server and doing a dev server and then you've got a production server or how do you guys go about changing the game of a game 
Oh, it's a it's a big to do actually. Um, so we have um, our infrastructure is uh, fairly large, and we're doing all of it in the cloud at the moment, and in the public cloud even. The idea every eight to ten players need their own game server. Now that's not necessarily physical hardware, or not even necessarily a virtualized operating system. It means the game instance of the Unreal Engine for them. So every eight to ten people need one of those, and they need it to be located very near them. So it needs to be located less than 50 milliseconds from them. So we do a whole lot of monitoring with our patcher and installer saying, where are you on the network, or your patcher launcher? So when you say, I want to play Hawken, we go ahead and look at where you are on the network and find all the different locations that we can put game servers and try to decide the best location for you. So you've got that element of monitoring and management. Um, most of our game servers only last about 90 minutes, so I don't worry too much about monitoring the machine that is playing a game. I worry much more about monitoring the services around it so that the services can manage, oh, we've lost that game server. We need to respawn a game server in that location for this, this team, this clan that was playing on there before. So my, um, my mantra here has been instrument everything until it hurts and then take one step back. Because you want to get as much data as you can, collect it, um, have it for analysis, have it to uh, actually inform the decisions you're making within your service and then feed it back into the, the service and the gameplay and the game servers and making sure that we know that you know, if Amazon's uh, one east, or if Amazon's um, US East 1C is down, then we don't want to be trying to put game players on there. We want to be playing, we want to be rerouting them somewhere else. But the, the big idea for me is instrument until you start to see performance degradation and then stop, and then move back some. Okay, so now what happens if this becomes uh, unreal, uh, as in uh, the amount of users? You must have some sort of crazy awesome infrastructure. How can you scale that quickly? I mean, are you prepared to do something like that? And how so do you prepare? we are prepared, <laughs> we hope. But yes, that is definitely one of the things I worry about in my, my late nights, uh, because we have no idea how big this game is going to be. And... With all the press, I and mean, we are the bell of the ball right now, so with all of the press, all of the media, all of the excitement and buzz around our game, we expect it to be pretty big, and bad infrastructure, bad performance can kill a game like that. So as I mentioned, we're running this out on the public cloud, and we're running it on multiple public clouds. So that's going to be another aspect that's going to be very interesting. At some point, we're probably going to look to put in a private cloud that we can spread some, uh, some gameplay across as well. But initially, we're going to start on AWS. Most likely, um, uh, our second provider will be Rackspace, potentially Internap. We'll see how it ends up working out. But I'm going to have multiple cloud providers uh, allowing us to scale this. And then it's just a matter of tracking the instances, because the scaling of the hardware isn't my problem just the scaling of the services that manage the instances and the services that manage the matchmaking because we have to match our game players to the servers that are near them and other game players to, to set up a full, uh, a full game. So have you gathered a few metrics? This is you know just a follow-up on what you're talking about. Have you gathered a few metrics on the different public clouds and found out which ones are better performance than others and are you kind of optimizing for the faster, the better the cloud, the more you're going to rely on them? Yes, and we have gathered some of those metrics. We are moving pretty slowly on that. We've been trying to get the, the base set up for the infrastructure nice and tight on AWS and then start generalizing it across multiple clouds. So at the moment, we've been focused on AWS, but we've got credentials and have done some benchmarking against the HP cloud. Um, we're going to do the same with Rackspace and Internet in the near future. So um, the reason I didn't mention the HP cloud in my list of likely early candidates is I want to make sure that they get out of beta and are nice and, and solid before I go ahead and put game players on there. Yep, understand. So are we going to see you in Santa Clara in a roughly short period of time? 
Uh, for Velocity? Yes. I may be down there. I actually didn't submit a talk this time because we are in the big run-up to our beta, so I've been trying to limit the number of talks that uh, I've been giving this year. I'll be at ChefCon next week okay. talking about um, basically what, what if you're building the next big thing? How do you plan for scaling? Uh, and then, let's see, what's the next place that I'm speaking at after that? You know, I'm not positive. I may not have anything on my calendar until OSCON. Until yeah. But, you know, it's always nice to run down to Velocity. So I may stop down there and watch a few talks and, and visit with the people. Great. Because it's a great, great crowd. Well, Sarah, I wish you guys well with Hawken and, and you and your new role as CIO. And uh, hopefully we'll see you uh, later this year. I know we will at OSCON at least. So. Absolutely. I will be all over at OSCON.